Both me and my wife Inka have been using NAC. We wanted to see if we get different results with it. My name is Seem Lund and I'm an anthropologist. And I'm Inka Lund, I have a master's in neuropsychology. And in this video we're going to discuss our experience with NAC and compare our results. So yeah, NAC is this supplement, an acetylcysteine, that is sold in anywhere online. And we have both been using it. I've been using it for a little bit longer, a few years on and off. And Seem has used it every now and then for a month or two or even three. And we just wanted to discuss our results because they were completely different. So make sure to click a like and subscribe for future videos about living longer and staying healthier. NAC or N-acetylcysteine is a supplement that's a precursor of amino acids called cysteine. Since 1990, it's also been sold as a supplement and it's studied as a nutraceutical for some general inflammatory conditions, like some neurological and psychiatric symptoms, as outlined in this scientific review. So let's talk about us taking NAC, starting with Inka. Right, so I have made a previous video about my NAC use to my channel and I have explained there how I've been getting quite a lot of benefits from NAC. So I used it about a year before because I was suffering from severe migraines and cluster headaches and I got relief from to my migraines during the life period when I was using the NAC. So I wanted to make the video and now I'm being very careful not to say that NAC cured or treated my migraine because I was using, using other supplements as well. And I've always been very careful with my lifestyle and use lifestyle tools as well to counteract inflammation that is associated with migraine. But since I've been taking NAC on and off for a couple of years now, I have been able to do these controlled experiments where I take NAC and I stop it and I start taking it again. And I stop it and I start taking it again and seeing if everything or anything changes. And consistently I come into a conclusion where when I start taking NAC again, I can see a reduction in my migraine frequency, my pain ratings. So how severe are my migraines? I can see a reduction in post-trauma and pro-trauma symptoms, which are the symptoms that precede migraine and the after effect, so to speak, when the pain itself, it gone, it's gone. And I guess a little good background is to tell that I was growing up with chronic migraine, which means that I had about 15 to 28 migraines a month. This means like as bad as it sounds. So at some months I was every day having pain. So it's chronic pain condition. And at the moment, I'm currently classified as on a remission, which means that I'm currently off medications. And I'm also experiencing maybe I have migraines uh, months when I'm completely migraine free, but I'm experiences from zero to five migraines a month. And they are very manageable. So usually I'm able to just get over it with a cold cap or some natural things. So back to NAC. So there was a scientific study in 2020 where they actually looked at the effects on migraine um, and migraineurs when using NAC. And they noticed a mean reduction of migraine days of three days and reduction of symptoms like uh, migraine duration, pain, medication use and um, pain severity. And I can definitely attest to that based on my experience. So I had a little gap with using NAC. So why I think it helps for my migraine is because of this antioxidant activity and because it lowers neuroinflammation. And I guess we are going to discuss a little bit more about the mechanisms later. But just now that I think that it's also been very helpful for um, other things. So recently I noticed an improvement in my liver values. And I told you that, hey, uh, like, I don't know if it's the NAC or if it's the dandelion and milk thistle that I'm taking, but my liver values have gone from high to optimal. And this happened, this change occurred around the same time and I, that I started reusing NAC. Uh, but I also started using milk thistle and dandelion for the mm. liver and chamomile. And they work through a similar pathway as NAC. Yes. So they kind of support each other. Definitely. And I just want to point out at this point that, you know, it is one of those medical uses that 
um, NAC is approved by FDA. So it's the liver toxicity induced by a paracetamol overdose. And I was treated with paracetamol or my la- like childhood. Mm. So I guess that affected a little bit of on my liver and right. maybe, maybe it has some benefits for now recovering it. And when we discuss about the mechanisms, then I can also point out maybe some risks or downsides that I've noticed. Mm. I have also measured my liver values around the same time when I did use NEC, but I didn't see any differences in my liver values because, yeah, my uh, liver values were already uh, normal and quite good. So I wasn't, you know, expected to gain any benefits uh, from that. So it does kind of work in situations with higher inflammation and higher oxidative stress, especially on like the liver side. You may be aware that there's an interesting situation with the FDA regarding NAC supplement status. In 2021, the FDA started examining the supplement status of NAC because of citizen petitions and because it was being sold and marketed for quote-unquote treating conditions that it's not intended to. Amazon quickly removed it from its stores, but the FDA didn't find any safety concerns related to the supplement. And a few months later, it was back on sale. As of now, NAC is classified as a supplement and you can still get it over the counter. So what were my results? I've been researching about the benefits of NAC for many years, up to four to five years, well before the FDA stuff. When the FDA announced that they were going to potentially change NAC status, I was actually buying like tens of bottles of NAC for future storage, just so I could give it to myself and my family if needed. However, so far I haven't been taking NAC that regularly because based on the research I might not be the best candidate for it. And this is why. The biggest general benefit of NAC is glutathione production, which is a powerful antioxidant. NAC alone increases glutathione, but the most effective way to do it is to combine NAC and glycine. Both glycine and NAC are precursors to glutathione. What's gotten me most excited about glycine and NAC as longevity supplements are several human clinical trials over the past few years. They've shown that glycine and NAC improve seven hallmarks of aging, including inflammation, cell senescence, and mitochondrial dysfunction, while also showing benefits in body composition, insulin resistance, cognition, muscle strength, and waist circumference. And I should say that this time I'm actually using glycine as well with NAC, and I feel like the combination is way better than NAC alone. All of this sounds amazing, but the caveat is that these studies were done on the elderly people. With age, especially after the age of 45, glutathione levels decline rapidly and inflammation levels increase. Fixing that glutathione deficiency with glycine and NAC has been seen to improve inflammatory markers and other functional outcomes. So I think that I'm already not expected to gain a lot of benefits from NAC because I'm young and my glutathione levels are already higher. But after the age of 45, when the decline in glutathione generally starts to happen, I might gain more benefits. Do you think you'll start taking it then? I do definitely think that if I'm you know, in my 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, then I would definitely take NAC and glycine every day. But right now, I just haven't noticed any significant improvements in my like health markers and in, like my well-being or my energy levels or anything like that that you do see in the other studies on the older people. However, I do use NAC when I'm about to get sick or if I'm already sick from some sort of an infection or a virus. In those situations, both of us, we take larger amounts of NAC and we notice that the uh, sickness and uh, virus kind of passes away faster and we recover pretty quickly as well. The only thing I do notice when I take NAC on a daily basis is that my muscle soreness might be slightly less, so my muscles feel less sore, and I recover from intense physical exercise a bit uh, faster. I actually notice this too, and my joints. Like if I do resistance training, Mm. then I can recover a lot faster and with less aches. And it's backed up by some actual studies where... NAC does reduce muscle soreness, but at the same time, it can also counteract some of the muscle growth signal if you take it after a resistance training workout. So it's a double-edged sword. It does reduce muscle soreness by reducing the inflammation, but uh, it can also like blunt some of the hypertrophy response. So let's talk about the dose of NAC. How much NAC uh, were you usually taking? Yeah, so based on all the studies that I read, I actually took, at the beginning, I took just 600 milligrams, but I didn't see any benefits. Then I ramped up the dose to 1200 milligrams. And that's when I started seeing and feeling the benefits. So that's where I kind of stayed within. Um, some studies even go up to 2400 milligrams, but I haven't yet tried it or I don't, I haven't seen a reason to really go higher because I'm already feeling or getting quite a lot of benefits from this one. Mm. And I do want to say a couple of caveats when using NAC. One is that if I take it on an empty stomach, I will feel extremely nauseous. 
So I don't know why that is, but I've heard this from so many people. How I counteract this is that either I take it with food or usually, and this is what I most commonly do, is that I just take it in the evening before bed, which for some reason helps me sleep as well. Mm. So that's what I've been doing right now. So, and with that, well, in the evening, I take three to five grams of glycine, but throughout the day, I may eat like three to 10, sometimes even 15 grams of glycine. Mm. It really depends on the day. And if I eat collagen supplements as well, um, this is, this has been my dose for a long time. Yeah. And the dosage depends a lot on the individual and their age and the inflammatory status. Because in the clinical trials that I mentioned earlier, the 2021 show that in the elderly people, a dose of 2.4 grams of NAC wasn't really effective, but a dose of 4.8 and 7.2 of both NAC and glycine was effective. So uh, that's quite a big dose. Yes, it is a very large dose. It's much higher than conventionally used. But uh, I mean, that's what the kind of study found. And it might be because the elderly people produce such a small amount of glutathione naturally, and uh, just providing the precursors, glycine and NAC in larger doses, is what's needed to see like an actual effect. But for you, you're young and you still produce sufficient amount of glutathione and you're just getting the benefits uh, at a smaller dose. Yeah. I want to talk about its effects on neurotransmitters as well. But just before that, I want to point out one single risk that I found recently. So I've also like seen, I've been just so interested in the studies and I keep following what's coming up. And there was a 2020 study that I just recently found, which looked at NAC users for 14 years. So it was a longitudinal study, and they looked at their relative risk of getting knee osteoarthritis. And this was very fascinating for me because the results were completely unexpected. Also for the researchers, their hypothesis was that NAC users would have a reduced risk of getting knee osteoarthritis, but they had four times higher risk. And that was people from 25 to 65. Hmm. So all age people, four times higher risk. It was the altogether the participants or 60,000 participants. So it hmm. wasn't a small scale study. It was actually quite a large study. So this is quite interesting. And what they hypothesized that maybe the effect is, so they don't know, obviously, because it's um, there are other studies that show that it can actually increase cartilage ter- turnover, like animal and tissue model studies. Um, but it might be that they were taking it already because they had joint issues or yeah, something so or inflammation or they were more prone to inflammation already, which made them take NAC and they developed the condition. So that's one explanation. Another explanation is that there is a real effect that um, NAC, there were some biological mechanisms that I didn't write down. I don't remember them right at this point, but there is something that can maybe uh, reduce the rate that the tissue is regenerating. So potentially like these are all hypotheses of course they don't really know why this happened but just I, I just wanted to i thought it's like a responsible to point this out because when i talk about my experiences with nac it sounds like mm. you know very magic. very beneficial <laughs> and magic but it's not i've done so many other things as well on the path and for me i just noticed the difference that it does help me but it's not to say that everyone will benefit or should use it all the time. And you need to do your own research about it, of course, like we all yeah. need to do of the supplements that we are using. Yeah, and with these antioxidants, they find similar effects, at least with all cause mortality. So like supplementation with vitamin C and vitamin E and vitamin E are found to be linked to higher all cause mortality and heart disease. But uh, you know that could also be because of the same reason that the sicker people or people who have some sort of a chronic disease are using it uh, for that reason. And it's not inherently potentially, or perhaps we don't know necessarily, but uh, it's not inherently because of the supplement uh, itself. All this is to say that I'll keep using it for now, at mm. least. And I'm going to keep a close look at the studies that come out. I'm personally not planning on using it. I might take it if I'm like uh, catching a cold or something uh, or a virus. But other than that, I'm not, I didn't see any like actual effects from it. And I'm more likely to take just the regular glycine so i'm getting i think some glutathione effects from the glycine already and uh, some other benefits for collagen and uh, other benefits 
I'll just briefly mention about the neurotransmitters because many people know NAC as the precursors of glutathione, but many people are not aware that NAC actually has shown to affect neurotransmitters as well. Uh, for example, it can downregulate, it, this is my studies, by the way, downregulate the dopamine transporter, which means that there is more available dopamine in the brain. And why I think it might be beneficial for migraines is that they find that migraineurs, there is excessive uh, neuroinflammation, which usually includes some sort of excessive glutaminergic signaling in the brain. It's called like excitotoxicity. And NAC has shown through the cysteine glutamate transporters actually balance this over uh, the signaling of glutamine in the brain. So technically lower the risk for this excitotoxicity. Potentially, these were animal models again, but that would maybe explain some of the effects on the migraine. So I have a more comprehensive video on my channel on my migraine experience. And also there is some mechanistic information about it and the information on how it has been studied in neuropsychological conditions. So if you're interested in learning more, you can, of course, check that video on my channel. And if you want a list of evidence-based supplements that I personally take and which ones I don't take, then check out my free supplement list. Other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure to click a like and subscribe. My name is Seem. Stay optimized, stay empowered.